One of my favorite drummers, another part of our conversation with the great John J.R. Robinson. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Music. When you opened up for Shaka Khan and Rufus and they asked you, was it that first gig they asked you after you, you guys were opening up for them that they came up to you and said, hey, you want to play? We weren't actually opening. We were in parallel gigs in Ohio. And uh, they came into our club. You know, I was like locked out in this club for a couple of weeks. And it was a smoking club called the Rare Cherry. What do you mean locked out? Well, we were working every night. You know, we, weren't, we, we were there for a couple of weeks. They happened to come in, I think it was the beginning of the second week. There was two, like, areas. This club was huge. It's like had, like, 3,000 seats on the dance floor, and then, we, then I had the whole live area where we were. And all of a sudden, I, you know, and I had studied the guys. I had studied the music. And, you know, anybody that was anybody, I think, fell in love with Shaka Khan in those days. So friggin' beautiful and innovative, you know, and... You know, come on, what chick today would ride bareback on an Appaloosa with a loincloth and a little thing over her units and ride in uh, with a uh, Indian headdress on? Come on, you give, you give me Beyonce doing that, I'll, I'll do backflips. <laughs> you know, that, that was real talent. So I knew all the stuff, and they came in, and they're sitting there, and I'm like, okay, I don't want to overplay. I just want to be myself. And then they came up, a couple of the guys, and they asked my leader, Jimmy, and they go, can we sit in with your drummer? And I'm looking, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sure enough, we cleared the band off. All the cats kind of struggled up and got their things together. And a few songs down the line, Shaka shows up, and, and that was it. And then I went and I hung with those guys till 6 a.m., and then I went to their sound check and sat in with them on their terms and that's when you go, uh, I'm sorry for their drummer, but I'm taking the gig, you know. Was that a defining moment, though? Because I talk to people and they always go, the, a lot of artists have the little, they're, they're just modest and it's nice. But at the same time, I'm always the guy who says, yeah, but you did the work. That's why you got into that room. Was that a defining moment for you where you go, did the work? And, you know, like you said, I'm sorry for the drummer, but it's, it's not even about that on some levels. What was that feeling like for you? Yeah, and, and, and it happened quickly. And, and I had to make a decision. I go, Sh I got I to gotta pack up and move from Boston, drive all the way out to Los Angeles. And there was a lot of unknowns. Am I getting paid? Am I really in the band? You know, it's just, it's just verbal bullshit. You know, how from old some, were you I, then? Do you remember how old you would have been? Yeah, I was 22, uh, tw uh, 22 23. You know, you, you have to trust in your fellow man. You know, and so I did. I mean, there was just a handshake. There was no contract. What and, did you it know, look like on the other side then in L.A.? What did it look like when you got when there? When I got there, I mean, I, st I stopped off in Iowa for about five days, saw my parents, and did a car change, and then made that trip west, which is one hell of a drive, by the way. Ooh, baby. I got there, and I'm, like, driving in the Los Angeles area, and I go, will this freeway ever stop what, why, where's the ocean? I don't understand. Why it says west, I'm still going west, and I'm not getting anywhere. Yeah, so I was a little freaked out about that. And so I'm calling up the secretary. I get off and get on a payphone. Oh, you just got to keep going further. So I finally get to the management office, and they put me up at a hotel for a week. Ironically, had not fired the previous drummer. Oh, boy. And I didn't find that out till the next day. And I go, Really? He goes, oh, no, we're going to fire him, we're going to fire him, we're going to fire him. Okay, well, I would suggest you go do that now, because I just busted my ass to get here. Uh, and sure enough, that happened, and then uh, slowly brought me in, and, you know, I had to work my way up. I was salaried. And I think a little, little tidbit of that information is, back in those days, in, in, in my svelte days, I was an A basketball player, and I'd always played basketball, and I always wanted to walk on to the Lakers camp just to say I did it, you know. And I knew a whole bunch of the Laker guys, and I was always playing basketball. So that first 11 months uh, in Los Angeles in 78, I was in the studio with Rufus, but I wasn't always working, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not playing keys. I'm just playing the drums. And so when I had time off, I used to go to Balboa Park down in the Central Valley and hustle basketball. 
and I, I met this little, uh, this, this little, like a guard, this dude, he'd hang out and smoke pot, and I go, dude, we're pretty good together, why don't we just start hustling? And she goes, okay. So, you know, come around noontime or 11, we'd go warm up, do some shooting, and all of a sudden a couple other guys would show up, and then i go, you guys want to play a game? Yeah, sure, you guys suck. Okay, bam, thanks for the 20, bye, keep doing that. So I hustled basketball for a while. That was fun. Son of a gun. By the way, going back to Shaka Khan, knowing what you know now, would you tell that 21, 22-year-old, would you give him, knowing what you know now, any advice? You know, I always had a thing for her. You know, and my working title of my future book is Never Sleep with the Lead Singer. So read into that. You know, I was offered, the minute I joined Rufus, to leave Rufus and go with her and get my own record deal and blah, 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 blah. It's just a bunch of bull. And I chose to stay with the five guys. From that came strength and solidarity. For example, Rock With You. That's Rufus with uh, David Williams plugged in. If I had gone with her, you know, she was going up and down anyway. And it's like, okay, why put all your eggs in one basket? So I guess your question was, do I do the same path today if I were now then? Is that what you kind of said? Yeah, well, knowing what I you think, know now. I think so. There's a very crucial moment when I was introduced to Glenn Fry by Hawk, and because they were buddies, and there was rumors that the Eagles were going to break up. And this was in 81. I just like just kind of said, okay, cool, you know, Glenn's cool, and then Glenn's taking me to the Laker games, and I'm sitting at the end of the bench with Magic, and this is cool, you know, and I went to the Dodgers World Series, and blah, 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 and so finally there came a time where I got a phone call from Quincy, and Quincy said, what are you doing these next two, three weeks? And I go, well, I don't know. I may have something. We'll put them on hold, and we're going to go in and, and start cutting the new Michael Jackson record, which would have been Thriller. So I wrote him down. At the same time, Glenn calls personally and said, do you want to join the band? And I'm thinking, and when's this going to happen? He goes, it's going to happen tomorrow. We start rehearsals to get ready to go on the road, and we're going to go out with uh, Fleetwood Mac, and then we're going to go tour Japan. I go, oh, and that means that I have to give up the Quincy Jones gig, which I have been the drummer for. So I'm thinking, all right, what am I going to get out of this? Well, without being prejudiced in any way, I'm going to leave a situation that's worldly and go into a white rock and roll situation. And out of that, I, I go, well, I've never done this before. You know, and I actually, to be honest, I, I'm not listening to the Eagles in my car. You know, I'm listening to Youssef Latif or something and Billy Cobham. So, okay, I decided to do this because I had never done it before. I lost the Thriller record. I am credited on certain parts of the Thriller record, but I lost the Thriller record. A lot of people go, well, don't you feel really bad about that? It's the largest selling record of all time. I go, but it still doesn't affect my 500 million records I've played on. So I went out with Glenn for almost a year on and off. Still did not lose the Quincy gig because then we got called to do, uh, you know, We Are the World and Bad, and, and I got other, you know, records uh, uh, in between there. So, you know, including, you know, obviously Off the Wall was the greatest. But, you know, I learned a lot from the Glenn Fry experience. Uh, and, and ironically, he said, never go play with Henley. Never play with Henley. And I go, I love Don Henley. You know, we'd be in airports, both camps. And you couldn't walk. It's like both camps had COVID. And we couldn't even talk to each other. It was really weird. And then finally, Henley calls me, and I ended up doing an Elton John, Don Henley uh, duet called Standing on Shaky Ground. So I got to work with Henley, and, uh, and uh, it was great. And I don't regret that. You know, I mean, do I want that credit, or do I want what that Glenn Fry thing led into? Well, I got Stevie Nicks out of it. I got uh, became musical director for John Fogarty. I got Peter Frampton, uh, four records, including Frampton Comes Alive 2, which to me is one of the greatest rock bands of all time. I got uh, Bob Seger's record, Like a Rock, Bonnie Raitt's record, and I'm sure I'm missing five or six, uh, all Warner Brothers projects just for one. So I think I did good. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. Mm -hmm.